So you just bought your CPU, RAM, and storage device, and they've arrived, but you have no idea if they actually work or not, and you don't wanna spend hours building your system just to find that you have a faulty component? It's time to bench test. Welcome back to the channel, and if you haven't heard of bench testing before, you're watching the right video. It's as simple as installing your CPU with a cooler, your RAM, and your storage device, and pushing the power button on your motherboard. It's really that simple. Let's get to it. The things you'll need to complete testing your build's components are the CPU, the system memory, which is commonly called RAM, the system storage device, and the power supply. In addition, you'll need the motherboard you are using in your build that was previously bench tested on its own. If you haven't seen my video covering how to bench test your motherboard, the link will be in the description and you can check that out. You also need some type of display that will connect to the output from the motherboard. The caveat to this is if you have a processor that does not have a GPU, like an Intel 13900KF, you'll need to have a standalone GPU to fully complete this test. If that's your case, then you would plug your display into the GPU and not the motherboard. To be able to navigate in the BIOS, your safest bet is gonna be a wired USB keyboard. Most modern boards will have a GUI that allows you to use a mouse to navigate, but that's not always the case, so the keyboard will be the surefire way to access it. I specifically say wired because it is hit or miss if a wireless keyboard will work in the BIOS. This is a very cheap wired keyboard that I bought specifically for testing purposes and I'll link it in the description below. Lastly, you'll need a cooler for your CPU as well as thermal paste. I'm just using an air cooler, but you could use an AIO liquid cooler instead. I also have my anti-static wristband on, so let's get started. The first step to this testing procedure is installing your CPU. I have a video covering CPU installation, which will be linked in the description below. Once you have the CPU installed, we can put the testing cooler on so that we don't overheat the CPU. Even though CPUs have built-in thermal cutoffs and protections, never run a CPU without some type of cooler attached. Now I've already put the bracket for the cooler underneath the motherboard, so I'm gonna go ahead and put thermal paste on. Now that the thermal paste is on, I can go ahead and put the cooler on. All right, the heat sink is on and we can go ahead and install the fan onto the heat sink. And then we can go ahead and plug the CPU fan into the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Next up, we're gonna install the RAM. And RAM isn't difficult to install. It can only go in one way and it has this notch here in the center that you're gonna line up with the center notch in the dim slot, and then you're just gonna push straight down and it'll snap into place. First, you have to open these tabs here on the ends of the dim slots. I just wanna make sure that all four dim slots are working, so I'm gonna do A1 and A2, and then I'm gonna test A2 and B2 and just leave the RAM there. The trick to installing RAM is to get both ends notched in first ensure that the center piece is lined up. So in this case, it is not lined up. So take it out, turn it around, reinsert both sides, double check the alignment. We have good alignment. So now we can just push down and the RAM snaps in place. Sometimes this tab won't snap on the RAM and lock it in place and you'll have to shut it with your hand, but that's okay. Just go ahead and push it shut and it'll lock the RAM in place. Okay, and that's all there is to RAM. Now I'm going to install an NVMe storage device into an M.2 slot that is under this lower heat spreader. NVMe storage devices are very easy to install. You just line up the short side with the short side and the long side with the long side. You insert at an angle and you push in until it's fully seated. You push the back side down 
and then whatever mechanism you have to lock it in place, either a quick latch like this, or sometimes there's a screw that you screw into this standoff and it holds the drive down. Right now, this drive is fully installed and ready to go. One thing to note, I didn't remove this covering over the heat pad as this is not its permanent home. I am gonna be removing it and putting it in the Dim.2 card up here, which I will be testing later. But if you're keeping your storage device in one of these or the one that's located under here, remove this covering on the heat pad before you install it. Now we can start plugging in power from the power supply to the motherboard. First, take your ATX 24 pin power connector and plug it into the ATX power port. Make sure it's all the way seated and you hear click before you finish pushing in as you want the plug to fully seat and you don't want any loose connections, especially with power. Next, take your eight pin CPU power connector and take it and plug it into your CPU power, which is typically located up here. Again, make sure you push in all the way until you hear it click. Now this board has two power plugs. You technically only need one 8-pin power connector to run the CPU. These other plugs are just to push extra power for overclocking. Lastly, we're gonna plug in our display into the HDMI port of the motherboard. And we're gonna plug our keyboard into a USB port. Last thing to do is plug the power into your power supply and turn it on. Okay, you can see lights are coming on on the motherboard indicating that it's in standby mode and we're ready to power the system on. Now some of you had questions on how to turn a motherboard on if you don't have a start button like this. And if you see these pins right down here, these are gonna be your case feature connection pins and a set of these pins are gonna be the power button pins. Now you reference your motherboard to indicate which of these pins are the power button, but in this case, it's gonna be the top two pins right up here. So to turn the motherboard on without a power button, you're gonna take something conductive like a screwdriver tip and you're gonna bridge the gap between the two power button pins, just like this. And it turns the motherboard on. Now the motherboard will go through post, it will do memory training, so it may take a bit for you to see any output. It will produce an output if everything is working correctly. So this is the output that the motherboard is producing right now, and it's displaying our CPU correctly it's detecting all of our system memory, as well as our M.2 NVMe storage device. This is indicating that all of these components are working appropriately and that there hasn't been any issues as it's gone through post. And if there was an operating system, it would have booted into the operating system. So the next step would be to move your NVMe storage device to each M.2 slot on the board and make sure that they all work and then move the RAM to the other DIMM slots. And then also, if you have a DIMM.2 slot, go ahead and test an NVMe storage device in the DIMM.2 slot. But to shut the motherboard off without a power button, it's the same process that you did to turn it on. Just hold the screwdriver onto the two pins until it turns off. Just like that. Now, as you're moving components around, make sure you turn your power supply off and unplug it from the wall so that you don't push any power to the board while you're working on it. All right, so I've tested every other configuration. This is the last configuration. I have both of my storage devices in the DIMM.2 slot, which is gonna be their permanent home. I have the RAM and the A2 and the B2 recommended DIMM slots and we're gonna go ahead and do this final test. So I'm gonna turn the power supply on, and I'm gonna push the start button to boot the system up. Here we can see the splash screen, and then again, we see the information. We have the CPU, we have the memory, and then we also have both storage devices as well. I'm gonna go ahead and hit F1 to enter the BIOS.
So here we see the BIOS and we can see some information about the system. We have system temperature here. We have the frequency of the CPU. We can see the frequency of the memory. We can see the total memory amount, just a lot of different information that you can look at. Obviously, this is where you tweak a lot of things, but just for this testing procedure, you can also see the information from the previous screen on this one. Over to advanced and down to NVMe configuration, we can see both of our storage devices and they are successfully being recognized. So since this test was successful, we can conclude that none of these components came dead on arrival. Now that I saw everything on the motherboard so far is working as intended and the system was able to post, I can confidently say that my CPU, RAM, and storage device are not dead on arrival. However, this does not eliminate all problems as you could still run into issues later. If this process uncovered any components that are DOA, initiate that warranty process with the manufacturer so that you can get a new component as quickly as possible. There are more testing steps to complete while the system is outside of the case, and those steps are gonna be covered in later videos. But in the meantime, you can watch more Tectonic Systems videos by clicking here and as always thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.